Um, before I jump into the message, I just want to let you guys know of a staffing addition we made. We actually made this addition back in March, uh, but we really just wanted to do this in person. It feels better when you get to welcome people, when you actually get to see the people, right? We're not on a video camera, so we brought, I, we were sitting right here earlier, Mackenzie, where'd you go to? Ah, right there. Mackenzie Porter, we brought on part-time uh, to help with next-gen uh, worship and, and administration tasks. And so um, I am thrilled to welcome her on to staff. She's going to be helping build. Yeah, go ahead and clap. Go ahead and clap. <laughs> welcome her. A lot of you have seen, we've seen Mackenzie up here on stage plenty, and uh, maybe what you don't know is that uh, she started helping me out in youth ministry. She started helping build the worship side of what we were doing in, in student ministry right away. And so there are just countless numbers of Sunday afternoons and Wednesday evenings that you've been here with the team. And so, um, and what we don't see also is that she's also in kids ministry all the time, just uh, leading out worship uh, motions and stuff in there. And so I just want to take a sec to kind of communicate the vision of why we would bring her on for this role. And it's because we just are, are loving the idea right now of what would it look like if rather than just kind of doing worship in here and singing songs on a Sunday morning, what would it look like if we began to cultivate little worship leading hearts at the age of three? You know what I mean? And what, would, what if we just like started inciting some wonder and awe and just inspiration in their little hearts? And so we've always done children's ministry. We've never done child care, right? We don't just babysit kids. We do children's ministry in different areas. But I'm really hoping and excited that, like just to see what McKinsey can help build and help steward, that we would start inciting wonder in kids' hearts when they're three, that she would continue to encourage them and equip them when they're in elementary school. But then ultimately that student ministry itself would also see itself as part of the pipeline for getting up here on stage. Like I, I just, I want to kind of connect the dots that, that student ministry isn't just a sidecar of our church, they're a part of our church. Right? Like they're a part of who we are, part of what we do, and so we'd love to just keep continually bringing up the next generation of worship leaders in this house, and I'm excited to see how she's going to help bridge that gap. So uh, buy her some coffee, buy her some lunch sometime, I don't know, amen, right? Like you would accept that and get to know her. Two things about Mackenzie that jump out to me right away. She is, uh, she's captivated and in love with Jesus, that's for sure, and she loves to worship him. And you spend any more than like two minutes with her and you will pick up on those two things. So spend some time with her, get to know her. Um, and that's that. So welcome, Mackenzie. Yeah. Amen. We're going to be continuing in Ephesians today. So we'll be in Ephesians chapter three. If you want to grab your Bible, we're going to open there in just a moment. But before we read the passage, what we're going to be reading today is actually a, a prayer that Paul felt was necessary to include in his letter to the church at Ephesus. And so I, I find this interesting, and I kind of want to bring our mind back to week one before we dive in and start reading the text to just say, okay, there's something about this that Paul says, it's not just enough that I would write this down, and it's not just enough that you would study it and read it. It's not just enough that you would gain some sort of intellectual understanding of what I'm saying here, but I'm going to stop for a minute, and I'm going to let you know that I'm praying for you, that I'm just begging the Lord might do something, right? I'm gonna stand in the gap. I'm gonna contend for your soul that you would get some of this stuff. And if you remember, before we started the book of Ephesians, I said, okay, hey, we're doing a study on, the, on Ephesians. We're gonna start reading through verse by verse through Ephesians. Then week one, I didn't even open Ephesians. Right, it was like kind of this cool slide of hand trick where I was like, Ephesians, psych, like we're not reading that yet. Because what we get to see in the unique perspective that can be gained for the church when we look at the church in Ephesus is that in Acts 18, we get to see it planted by Paul. And we get to see some of the things that first happen in Ephesus. Then we get to read about it being encouraged in the book of Ephesians, right? It was just a letter that Paul wrote is now what we call the book of Ephesians was a letter that Paul's writing that would circulate around to the churches in Ephesus. But then it's fascinating too, because in Revelation chapter two, we get to see the church in Ephesus rebuked by Jesus. And so, and so I just want to kind of bring our mind back to this understanding, back to this reality that you can be doing Christian things Right, we talked about in the very first week when the, when, when the church in Ephesus was planted, they were committed to the apostles' teaching. They were sitting, learning every day. They were, they were going to the temple and they were getting understanding of what this book is all about. They were, they were extolling the name of the Lord is the other thing that's listed. That means they were praising, but they weren't just praising like, oh yes, Jesus, my Savior. They were like excited, right? They were, they were enthusiastically extolling the name of the Lord. The other thing that they did was they confessed and divulged their practices, 
right? That's fun. Can we all agree? But we said that here in our church, in this context, what we best understand that to mean is, like, I'm not going to pass the microphone around and say, okay, now's the time for confessing and divulging of your week. But instead, what we do value is we say, man, you got to get yourself in a community, in a smaller group of people where you can take the mask off, right? The irony, first service when everyone was in masks. And I was like, take the mask off. Wait, no, leave it on. Like, but what I meant was, we got to get to this spot where we're just unveiled before the person in front of us. And we say, hey, look, here's who I really am. Here's the things that are really going on in my life. Here's the spots where I really fall short. Here's the things, that, the insecurities I'm really struggling with. And you got to find those people to get around, to be honest with, because until you're able to do that, you're never going to be able to experience love truly from somebody else. And so they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They extolled the name of the Lord. They confessed and divulged their practices. And then the last thing that we said was they took sin seriously. If you remember, in, in Ephesus was this temple, Artemis, and, and there was all this like pagan worship, and they built all these little idols there. And because like the followers of Christ were gaining such ground, it actually collapsed this entire economy around the silversmiths. Like they didn't have any bit, there was no money to be made in, in making these false idols anymore. And so just this awesome idea as a church is like, man, we actually have the ability, if we can get people to go all in, we could actually change things. But they took sin seriously. They brought all of their idols and they burned them all. They got rid of them. They took that dramatic step to get the sin out of their life. And, and what we have to remember then is that in Revelation chapter 2, you have this church that's doing this awesome stuff and they got awesome leadership in this church. And, and Jesus even says to them, man, you know what, you, got, you guys are doing a lot of things really well. You're being really patient in your endurance for me. Like the world's getting tough, but you just keep pressing on into what is good. You, you've, you've committed yourself to teaching so much so that you're able to test the false teachers and you know what's not true. And you're, you're pressing in, you're enduring these trials, but I have this against you. You've neglected the love that you had at first, right? And it's this idea that you can be doing the Christian things, you can be showing up at church, committed to teaching, worshiping. You know, you know the spots in the worship song to lift your hands. You know the spot in the worship songs where you, you, know, you know all the stuff. You know the cues. You're singing. Just like the verse that Katie shared, you might, you might, your lips might be honoring God, but it's your heart that's far from him, that that's the real damage that's happening. Because you can be doing all this Christian activity, but, but if you're not using those things to incite love in your heart, then you're missing it. You're missing it. And so before we read this prayer today, we just got to kind of set the tone for what this is going to be, that, man, there are, there are ways that we hear teaching in church and we go, okay, now what am I going to do? And, and you got to just hear at the beginning of this that the point is a relationship with Jesus, that there's something inside it and awakened in you that you just crave him all the more. That's what this is about. So let's dive in and read Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Kids, if you want to read along on the screen or if you have your Bible with you, that's awesome. It starts this way. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, you may, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I'm thankful right away for just all the wiggling going on in this room. Growing, thriving churches don't have wiggling behinds in chairs or on the floor. And so we just welcome it. We're grateful for it. God, I ask that you would move today, that your spirit would be available to those who are earnestly seeking you, and that you would come in and that you would, that you would draw us deeper. So many different spectrums in faith represented in this room right now. And I just pray that your mission today, I believe you want to just take people deeper. And so we just ask for it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So there's a few things in this prayer that I think we have to grab out. And so um, the first thing is it says, for this reason. And like I kind of joked about last week, it feels like every subheading of the book of Ephesians starts with, for this reason. Therefore, I write this because, and it's just all of this like effort to sort of show you how it's all tied together. And rather than go and unpack the first three chapters, here's what you have to know. The first three chapters of Ephesians set up who God is, what he's done, and I don't have time to go through it. So if you missed the series, go back and listen online. But, but he sets up, this is who I am, and this is who I've called you. And then in four, five, six, he's going to pivot and he's going to start to say, and now this is what the church should look like. And this is how you're going to walk in love. And this is how you're going to be a parent. And this is how you're going to steward this calling as a servant to me. And ultimately where the book is going to end, and I'm just so excited, is he says, now this is the fight that you got yourself into and how you're going to get ready to fight. And so before he shifts, he prays. He prays and he begs the Lord for a few things. He gets on his knees and he prays. And there's three things here. That according to the riches of his glory, we can all agree that's a lot, right? Like the glory that he possesses is the kind of glory where he just opens his mouth and the universe falls out. And it's all being perfectly sustained and, and moved along according to the, you know, beautiful symphony that he's conducting. So his glory is amazing. And according to that glory, the riches of that glory... He grants us to be strengthened. Paul is begging that we'd be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. I don't love that inner being phrase, if I can be honest. It's a little too like psychology-y for me, right? It feels like I'm like meditating, like, hmm, my inner being. You know what I mean? But what Paul's asking for here is that, that there, there's that part of you that we all know about that, that desires and has compulsions for things that my head has convinced me aren't good or that my head knows. Like intellectually, I know it's not good. And yet my, I have this thing in me that just does these things that even I don't really want to do. So let's pull it off. Maybe the Bible pulled off some like kind of seriousness for a little bit. And let's just talk about my monthly budget. My monthly budget, like I, I sit and look at, okay, we're going to have this much money come in. I'd like to save this much money. I'd like to put this much money, maybe, eight, maybe extra to the house. I'd like to maybe save for retirement someday. Like, invest for college, kids' college, like that's probably going to be expensive, probably not going to get there. You know, they're just going to have to do it themselves, guys. I love you. But um, <laughs> I get all these maybe goals that we'll sit down and discuss, but then, and intellectually, I know, okay, that's the kind of guy I want to be. This is the kind of way that I want to run my finances, right? But then, come on, somebody, like I know I'm not alone, like it's Tuesday, it's been a long day, and I don't want to cook, and I don't want to clean up, so I go to Chipotle again. I go to Chick-fil-A again, you know what I mean? I just am like, okay, and I have, this, I have this compulsion to just do what's easy in the moment. And that's a silly example, but a lot of you can think of maybe even a more serious example in your life of like, man, I just wish I wouldn't give myself over to, and in your mind you're convinced of it, but then there's something in you that you lose that desire when push comes to shove. And so what Paul's praying here is that you'd have this thing inside of you that it would be strengthened in your inner being by the power of the Spirit. So what he's saying is that the gospel is not about us being once bad people and now we're good people. The gospel is about us once being dead and now we're alive. But what, God, what, what Paul is writing here, what God echoes is that, man, I don't just want your behavior. I don't want, just want you to behave correctly. I actually want to rework and create new desires in your heart so that your compulsion, so that the things you long to do line up with who I am, Jesus, not with who you used to be. Right? And that's only going to come by the strengthening, by the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And so Paul prays for it. He asks for it. The next point, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. I love that phrase. It makes me think of my, my neighbor gave me a tomato plant a couple weeks back. And he, like, whatever, planted too many plants. He's that kind of guy. And so he's like, hey, I got an extra tomato, and you want it? And you can't say no, right? It's like, it's a tomato, sure. Like, planted it in the backyard. And that day I planted it. Katie and I were out there. We're pulling weeds and whatnot. And, Kate, and Haven, our little baby who's, like, you know, somewhere right now. She's not even here anymore. Um, she, she sees us pulling weeds. And so a couple minutes later, what does she do? She hands me the tomato plant, <laughs> which, like, total sidebar. Like, I replanted it, and it's still growing. How amazing is that? That's just cool. I don't care who you are. But I, like, she hands me this plant, and the reason she was able to pull it out is because like, it hadn't taken root yet. Like, it wasn't rooted and grounded into the ground yet. And that's how some people settle to live in their faith. 
right? It reminds me of the parable of the sower where some of, some, sometimes the message is preached and it lands on rocky soil. And that rocky soil, man, it lets, the, it lets the plant sprout right away. But then as soon as the heat comes, there's no moisture. There's no root system that's taken place. It's not established on Christ's love. So it withers. So it withers. And how many of us just are okay with saying, oh, okay, like I'm just not going to go deep, but I'm just going to be here and I'm just going to exist. And man, when times get tough, you get locked into pan- pandemic mode for a few months, you just feel it. You start to wither, Right? And, and so the, the call here is that you'd be rooted and grounded in love. It makes me think of in Psalm 1, where, where it says that, man, God's desire for you to be like a tree planted by living water so that even in any season, no matter what's happening around you circumstantially, you, you would be bearing fruit in all seasons. You'd be green and thriving in all seasons, right? That's this picture that you'd be this rooted, planted, grounded tree, not some flimsy little tomato plant that a two-year-old could pluck out. And... and and so the, uh, the question I think that everyone needs to ask themselves at this part of the prayer is, do I live my life from a position that says, no, I'm rooted and grounded in Christ's love for me? D- like the way you think, the way you act, is that, does that spring from a place that says, no, God loves me and he's for me? Or is it not? As Paul's asking here, he says, man, I just hope that you'd be rooted and grounded in love. Love that's so big. I love that he kind of tries to put words to it here, Right? I just hope that you can understand with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? Like kids, just do this for me. Just like, hey, kids, just how big can you make your arms? Like how big? Yeah, oh, it's pretty good. I'm taller than you, so I can make my arms bigger. But Paul's kind of just like, how big is God's love for you? He's like, I don't know. Like, it's like, it's like this big at least, you know? He's trying to articulate in words. He just says it's so huge that you can't even really understand it because this next line, he says, I'm praying that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Full confession, that sentence is a little weird to me, that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How can you know something past knowing? It's the same word, it's just used two different ways, Paul. Like, how can you know something past knowing? Let me explain it this way. I I know a little bit about, like, astronauts. The Falcon 9 launch, right, that SpaceX just did. I'm kind of interested in, like, that whole story. And this, I think this guy, Elon Musk, he's, like, he's kind of quirky, but he's cool, right? And he launches the Falcon 9, and the Falcon 9 has nine engines on it. That's why it's called the Falcon 9. Where it got the Falcon was because he's a Star Wars fan. So he named it after the Millennium Falcon, literally. So he launches this thing into outer space. And I can even tell you a little bit about, like, the gear that I saw the astronauts wearing. they got to wear a helmet, right, because there's no oxygen up there. And, and what Elon Musk is trying to do is he's trying to create a reusable rocket so that we can eventually, like, go and do travel in space commercially. Don't sign me up, ever. <laughs> I have, like, an irrational fear that I'm just going to float away into deep space someday. And I don't, I don't know why that's there. I, mean, I maybe watched the wrong movie at the wrong time in my childhood. But he's – so – you got training that astronauts got to go through, right? Because they experience like all this G-force when they're la- like, you know, they're strapped to a rocket, folks. Like they launch up into outer space. Like you don't just, pra- you don't just go without practicing that. And so, like hear me, I know a bit about astronauts. I know there's more to know, but I know a little bit about astronauts. I don't know what it be- it's like to be in space. I don't know what it's like to be strapped to a rocket they count down, and I'm sitting on however many thousand tons of oxygen and kerosene as they're like five, four, three, two, one, and that thing lights while I'm on a seatbelt on the inside. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. I don't know what that feels like. So even though I can attain a lot of knowledge about what it's like to be an astronaut, until I actually experience it, it's just kind of like me describing something to you. Do you see how this transports to our faith? It translates to our faith? Where, where you can memorize and you can know a lot about God. You can have a knowledge base that you accumulate about him. You can memorize the Bible stories. You can memorize the scripture. You can tuck those away in your heart. And I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I'm saying what those things should do is they should propel us. They should draw us deeper into this personal experience. That's the gap between knowing and knowledge. It's this personal experience that takes you farther so you can know, say, no, no, no. I can tell you what Jesus is like. Let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me tell you the, like, how I've experienced his love for me. I've experienced his grace that he's poured out lavishly. I've experienced his resurrection power because I no longer crave the things I used to crave. I don't like to do the things that I used to do. I'm now wholly set on him. I've experienced something and I can tell you about it. 
It's not good enough to just have a head understanding of who Jesus is. We have to know him personally, a knowledge that surpasses knowing. I think there's, there's kind of caricatures of churches here, right? Where, where you maybe have uh, the charismatic church that's just like hyper experience focused. It's just like, man, and, and so like, get me, I, like some of you are in here right now. I get it. It's cool. All right, we're cool. We can hang out. But some of you are like, why is this guy even preaching still? We should be worshiping. We should just be soaking in the presence of the Lord. Like get this guy out of the way, right? And there's some of you who, who are just like, man, we worshiped way too long. Can you believe how many times we repeated that one line in worship? Right? Come on, now I'm actually starting to get a little more personal here. You're like, I can't believe it. We just, we just sang. And then, you're like, and then those kind of people, it's like, well, do you love Jesus? And you're like, yeah, can't you tell? I stood here like this in worship the whole time. I'm not knocking, okay? I'm just saying there's these kind of caricatures of churches where they can be like really word-focused, Bible-focused, and, and the, the wrong conclusion that we can draw is that those are very dry and there's nothing really authentic there. But then you can have people who are like, man, I'm so spiritual. And I'm like, but do you even know a verse of the Bible? And so just to kind of paint the picture, right? Like we have put all of our cards down as a church and just said we want to long to hold both in tension. And so what that's going to create in here in this room is there's going to be some of you who think I should preach less. Some of you who think we should just worship more and I should preach more. Like it's just going to be this kind of delicate walk that we do where we want to experience God. We want to know him deeply. We want to be in love with him and we want to be biblically serious because the knowledge that surpasses knowing isn't separate from knowing, right? That's where some people get off. They want to make the experience the main thing. But you gotta, have a, you gotta have an experience that's driven from, that stands on a platform of knowing who he really is. Otherwise, you're not really worshiping who he really is. So we gotta be biblically serious, but it's not meant to terminate there. It's meant to incite worship and love and adoration for the person of Jesus. So, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. This last line is crazy. And that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And you can spare the hand raising, but like anyone in here just feel like they're like walking in the fullness of God right now, right? So what we're gonna do, we got about 10 minutes left, we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. We're gonna beg, and I was on my knees right here this morning asking the Lord that he would meet you in your prayer today and that you would be, that something in you would light up, that you'd be woke up to something, that there is a greater fullness of God that you could walk in. There's three main points that I want you to consider as you're praying today. There's three like really um, unfathomable things that Paul walks us through in the first three chapters of Ephesians. In chapter one, he says this, that you, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Paul, could you put a unit of measurement to that? Well, yeah, sure he could, but we couldn't measure it. You can't capture the amount of power that God has and it's available for you. Are you walking in it? The other one that he says is Ephesians chapter two. He says that... uh, He made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus. Are you aware of how much grace God has poured out for you personally in your own life? Can you fathom how much grace it took to save this church? But then that grace also then compels us and sustains us to keep pressing forward that we wouldn't use that grace as a license to sin, but that grace would then empower us and motivate us and sustain us in righteousness. And then the last one that he says, and it's probably my favorite one, is in chapter three, where he's talking about, man, it's, it's been my task to go and take this gospel to the, to the Gentiles, and I was called to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know why heaven's gonna be forever? Part of the reason why I believe heaven's gonna be forever? Because his riches are unsearchable. And it's gonna take that long to figure out all of who he is. Right? We could spend our whole life trying to articulate it. We could spend our whole life trying to write it all down or trying to sing about it. We'd only scratch the surface. That's how good he is. And so Caden's gonna come on, he's gonna play some keys for us. And, and my picture, especially in this service, knowing we're gonna have some families, I just wanna say this to you parents, like just put your hands on your kids and just beg that the Lord would wake something up in them. I had a little conviction this week as I realized most of my prayers for my kids revolve around, man, let's, let's get a good night's sleep tonight. Yes, Lord Jesus, amen. And help them have good godly dreams. Help them grow up to love you. Help them help put good friends in their life. Help them to do well in school. And there's nothing wrong with those prayers. Those are all God-honoring good prayers. But I'm like, man, do I ever pray for my kid to be walking in the fullness of God? 
right? There's more, there's deeper. And so we're just gonna ask the Holy Spirit that if he has more of himself, if, God, if there's more to God, don't you want it? Don't we want it? I long to be a church, I'll close with this and then we'll pray. I long to be a church where, where nominal Christianity goes to die. That doesn't mean that you can't be nominal when you walk in. If you walk in and that, your faith is barely burning there and it's just like this like little ember that used to exist, that's cool. I just hope we're preaching in a way. I hope we're worshiping in a way. I hope the community that exists in here just always says, hey, but there's more. There's more. There's deeper, we can, there's deeper waters we can go in. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, there's less control, but we can go deeper. We can go in. Let's go. Amen? So man, let's pray. And Jesus, even as we come to the table, we're reminded of our desperate need for our Savior who broke his body and spilled his blood for us. And so Jesus, I pray from that humble posture, would we have the boldness to ask for more of you in our life? in the immeasurable power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead and that seated him in heavenly places far above all rule and authority, and power and dominion and above every name that isn't to be named. That's where you are, Jesus. And that power that holds you there is available to us. Would we be a church who walks in it? Would we raise kids who walk in it? that uh, the immeasurable grace that you lavished upon us would draw us in a deeper relationship, that it would captivate our, our hearts into more awe and wonder and love for you, Jesus, that we wouldn't use it as a license to sin, that we wouldn't use it as a, as a means for us to just continue to do on and things that we want to do because you'll forgive us, God, but would we see that grace transform us? Would we be a gracious people here? that extend that grace readily to people who aren't in the same spot we are. Jesus, I pray, that, I pray that we as a church would ponder the unsearchable riches that are found in you this week. That for each heart, for each soul in here today, even for the youngest ones, God, would we just, would we just spend time searching? Even though it's unsearchable, would we try? Would we try and find out all of it? Would we try and dis discover more of who you are? Lord, take us deeper. Take us where you want us to go. We want more of you. We're not gonna settle for half in and half out. God, we're in, we're pursuing, we're desperate for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.